Amen. Thank you, Colin. Good morning. We're starting a new series today in the book of Daniel, and I want to start with a message. Thank you. I want to start with a message uh, about the power of one decision. And I want to show you the impact that one decision can make in your life uh, for repercussions and ramifications for the future. Uh, one of the things I love is being a parent of two boys. Anybody love being a parent? Anybody humbled by being a parent? You know, my parents are loving the fact that I'm a parent. Why? Because as they're watching right now, they are laughing at the way the boys are doing to me like I did to them, right? You know, they say the older you get, the smarter your parents become. Right? My dad's a genius, right? Now. My mom's a genius, right? But Candy and I, she'll tell you, we're at a stage now where our kids say, y'all don't know anything. Anybody have kids like that or is that just us, right? Like, you don't know what it's like to be in middle school. No, like, uh, like we were in middle school at one time. You don't know what it's like dating. You don't know what it's like in sport. Uh, I would admit, though, I don't know much about football, which my boys want to play football. They're actually playing football now. Uh, believe it or not, I never played a game of football in my life, so I'm learning. I don't even really watch football. You may say, well, I thought you were an LSU fan. I am. I just like to check the score really at the end so I can come and take shots at Colin when we beat Florida. But anyway, other than that, I don't really watch a lot of sports. So I'm learning the game, right? And so I'm learning because the boys are on the line. So uh, they're playing like left guard and defensive end and tackle. And so I'm learning some of these positions and I'm realizing that there's a certain way to play football, right? Especially on the line. Like you can't just line up any other way. Like your feet have to be straight. Your knees have to be in line. Your back has to be flat. Your head or your hat has to be up. You have to drive a certain way. You have to know when to come off the line. And so we're learning. Now, my boys were saying, well, dad, I'm not real good. You know, it's their first year. I'm not real good at football. I said, well, I, I, I get that. I mean, I'm not real talented like the other kids. I said, oh, I get that. And so I told him, I said, you know, you may not be as talented as the other kids. You may not be as skilled as the other kids. But there's a thing that you can do the other kids won't, and that is you can outwork all the other kids. So this was yesterday morning in the Gallaty house. I mean, we don't play around on Saturday mornings. And so here we are, I bought a sled. Again, I went on YouTube and the sled looked like something to help. And now Candy's seeing this for the first time, so I did not approve using the sled on her wood floors. But <laughs> somebody did tell me after the first service that a colored pencil will take out all those scratches we put in yesterday, right? But, but you know this, like it doesn't matter what sport it is or in life, there's like a certain way to do something and there's a wrong way to do something. I love what Augustine said, uh, St. Augustine from years ago. He says, right is right, even when no one's doing it. And wrong is wrong, even if everyone is doing it, right? So the book of Daniel for us over the next three weeks is really going to set us up for the series after Labor Day or on Labor Day. But by the way, if you're going away for Labor Day, you want to tune in because that'll be day one. But what we're going to see is, is that life is the same way, that we need to stand on the word of God and head after God regardless of what the culture is doing. And I'm gonna give you three examples, one this week, two in the successive weeks, about what it means to stand up for what is right in the lives of Daniel and his three friends. So if you have a Bible, uh, turn with me to the book of Daniel. Daniel chapter one, we'll consider verses one and following. We like to say word at Long Hollow. When we get to the word, we know it's the word that changes our life. And so when you're there, you can say word. word. The word of the Lord. In the third year of the reign of King Jehoiakim of Judah, King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and laid siege to it. The Lord handed King Jehoiakim of Judah over to him, along with some of the vessels from the house of God. Nebuchadnezzar carried those vessels to the land of Babylon, to the houses of his God, and put the vessels from the temple treasury in the treasury of his own God. You talk about blasphemy here. I want to teach you one negative, uh, one warning, if you will, and then I want to give you one positive insight on how to live for the Lord. Here's the first one, and we'll start here. We pay a price, I want you to get this, for living in sin. You and I pay a price for living in sin. Babylon was led by a man named King Nebuchadnezzar, 
And uh, he had a plan to take over the world. And as he was going through this goal of life, he came across Israel and decided to destroy the nation. They were in his way. And so over the course of about a two and a half year period, he ransacked the community. He decimated the temple. He took the treasury vessels, including the Ark of the Covenant. And that was the last time, believe it or not, the Ark of the Covenant was in the temple forever. People don't realize this, just a side note, that in Jesus's day, there was no Ark of the Covenant in the Holy of Holies. There was nothing there. And so the Pharisees and Sadducees were playing a game with God. It's a whole nother sermon for another day. But this is when the Ark is taken. So it's taken to Babylon and it's desecrated. God's name is defamed. But they, put, they put this in the temple of a false god. Now, Babylon's not a new city. In fact, we learn about the city of Babylon back in the book of Genesis when we meet a group of people trying to build a tower to be like God. You remember this, the tower of, remember the name? Babel, Babel, Babylon, same group. And Babylon's bigger than a city, write this down. Babylon, whenever you read in the Bible, particularly even in Revelation, Babylon at the end, Babylon is a city and a system. It's a city and a system. Babylon is a spiritual force that exists in every generation. The system of Babylon, the pagan society, the secular system is against the kingdom of God. So for example, where the kingdom of God stands for purity, the kingdom of Babylon stands for immorality. Where the kingdom of God stands for peace and propagates peace, the kingdom of Babylon propagates strife and war. Where the kingdom of God basically goes out about love and care, the kingdom of Babylon is about hate and anger. And so you see the difference here. So Babylon's way bigger than a city. Now God's gonna use the prophets leading up to this and he's gonna say, hey, listen, you, you guys have a choice. The people of God have a choice. You can follow me or you can give in to sin and live in sin. And if you do that, I'm gonna remove you from the land that I promised to your forefathers and I'm gonna exile you to Babylon. And that's exactly what happened. And I wanna just say this as a, as, a, as a warning to all of us, since God is the same yesterday, today, and forever, which is what the Bible says, God will not hesitate, I want you to get this, in doing the same to us who persist in sin. God does, listen, God doesn't play around with sin. And believe me, I know firsthand, I remember when I was a new believer, uh, the day God, saved me, November 12, 2002, which is 20 years ago this year, but believe it or not, it's hard to believe. 20, 20 years ago, November 12, I was radically saved. And the day I was saved, I just knew I was gonna be called to preach. And I didn't know what that meant. I didn't have a dad in the ministry. I'd never been to seminary. I didn't know the Bible, never read the Bible, casually went to church. But I had the Holy Spirit of God living within me. And I had the word of God that I could preach from and I had a repertoire of magic tricks and card tricks and illusions in my back pocket, right? Like, as I learned some of those things as a child. And I, didn't, and I realized early on that student ministry loves illusions and card tricks, amen? Like even our student ministry this summer, how many people went to camp this year? We're still hiring illusionists. I think I missed our gig. Candy, it could be a traveling illusion, right? But anyway, I, I knew how to do magic tricks. I did not know the Bible. And so what I would do is I, I realized, okay, let me call the only Christian I know at the time, which was the guy who led me to Christ named Jeremy Brown. I said, Jeremy, hey, God's called me into the ministry and he told me that you and I are gonna be in a ministry together. He said, who is this again? I said, <laughs> I said this is Robbie Galilee. I'm a Christian now, I'm a preacher, right? God's told us we're gonna be in ministry. He said, that's crazy because God hadn't told me anything. Well, eventually Jeremy came around, right? And we started the ministry with a pretty novel name. We called it Galaty and Brown Ministries, right? I mean, that's what we, we called it. And believe it or not, by God's grace, we started preaching all over the South. I mean, we were blown away. People would call us up and we'd do fifth quarter events. Y'all remember those? Those fifth quarter events after the football games and uh, we'd do outreach events. And man, God was just using us. People were responding to the gospel. I would take, uh, I would start with doing a magic trick or a card trick. I would take a Bible passage out of context. I didn't know any better, right? And then I would do another trick and then I would give an invitation and people would respond. Well, in about three or four months, I, I, I developed this this pride in what was happening that I felt invincible. 
I'm like, man, I'm no longer a drug addict. God's using me. I'm going to go back into the world and save two of my friends who were still addicted to heroin and cocaine. And I thought, you know what? I'm a Christian now. I'm not tempted anymore. And so I went back in the world. Sadly, both of those guys have passed away since then. But I went back and I said, hey, Eloy, do you mind? Uh, uh, let me tell you what God is doing in my life. Do you mind if I share that with you? And he's like, not at all, Robbie. It's good to see you. Do you mind if I roll a joint while you do it? I was like, no, not at all. I mean, I'm, I'm a Christian. I'm a preacher. What are you talking about? No, go ahead. And I don't remember how it happened, but I just know in about two weeks' time, I was back on drugs and alcohol again as a Christian, as a preacher, as a man of God. Now, here's the thing about a relapse. And if you have a family member or a friend who's ever relapsed on drugs or alcohol or any sin, when you relapse on drugs and alcohol, you never start over. You pick up where you left off. And this is one of the reasons a lot of people, when they relapse, they die. The heart can't take it. The body's not prepared for it. And so I relapsed and picked up where I left off. But this time, I'm still preaching. I have about two months of, of speaking requests and engagements that are locked in. And, it, and I tell you this real humbly and really uh, with trepidation because it's just unbelievable, the grace and mercy of God. I would get high in the bathroom and then go preach the youth event and share the gospel and by God's grace, people would respond. Like people were still getting saved, not because of anything I was doing, in spite of everything I was doing, God's word never returns void, amen? It never returns void. And every night I knew it was wrong and I was addicted again and I was really upset with myself and I would go back to the hotel room, whatever, I was, whatever city I was in, and I would just sit in the conviction of the Holy Spirit. I knew it was wrong, but I couldn't get out. And then finally, all of a sudden, toward the end of that two-month period, May 1st, I remember it, 2003, 19 years ago, 20 years ago, this coming May, once and for all, I don't recommend this, but I took the drugs and the cigarettes, I was back on, put them on the bed of a hotel room, and I said, God, I'm done. And supernaturally, God took it away. And by God's grace, I've been sober almost 20 years this May. May 1st, I'll be sober. Yeah, 20 years this year, yeah. Unbelievable. Uh, and I tell you that to just tell you about the grace and mercy of God to spare my life because I knew it was wrong, but, I, but, but here's, the, here's the insight I learned. Once I was back on drugs, it was like all of the events that were supernaturally happening stopped coming in. The, the youth pastors stopped calling. The, the ministry started to implode. And eventually the whole thing was shut down as quick as it started. And for one year, and I don't know if you've ever been in this world, and there's some of you there now, one year, I knew God had a call on my life to preach, but no one gave me an opportunity for one long year. Here's the valuable lesson I learned. I want you to write it down. You need to write this down if you're taking notes. You can't play with sin. You cannot play with sin. There are consequences to sin. And I don't know where you are today. You know better than I do. God knows better than both of us. But here's what I want you to get from someone who's been there and tried to hide it for a season. I've realized that what we try to hide before God, he'll reveal before men if we don't confess it. We say that again. What you try to hide before God, which he already knows in sin, one day, you can do it for a season, but one day God's gonna bring that to light before men. Here's what God would say to you today if you're in this kind of lifestyle. Do you think you can keep on sinning and claiming to be a Christian? Do you not know my word that I said every secret hidden thing will be brought to light one day? I mean, what do you think I'm bluffing? This is what God would say. What do you think I'm bluffing? Do you think I'm playing? And so I want to say this to you with, with a lot of love and a, and a lot of humility, but I want you to receive this. If you are in sin right now, look at me. I'm going to ask you right now, just, just close your eyes for a moment. I feel like we need to, need to do this now because some of you are at a point of decision even right now. Would you just close your eyes for just a moment if you're at home Join us, and I want to ask you, if you are in sin and you're ashamed of it and you're overwhelmed by it and you don't want to do it anymore and you know it's wrong, let me ask you, would you just repent right now? Confess it to God and ask for his assistance. 
and run to Jesus. Don't go back to it. Repentance is not remorse. It's not saying I'm sorry and then returning. It's cutting off all ties and never going back. There is a price, you can open your eyes, there's a price to pay when we live in sin. But thank God we have a Savior that welcomes us back when we confess, amen? Number two, and here's the good, uh, the uplifting part, if you will, the, 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 the encouraging part of the message, and this is the secret to Daniel. We have to decide to live for Jesus. And the key word there is decision. We have to decide, we have to determine to live for Jesus. Look at verse three if you have a Bible. The king offered Ashpenaz, his chief eunuch, to bring, and that's a key word there, eunuch, just remember this word, to bring some of the Israelites from the royal family and from nobility. Go find me some young men without any physical defect, good looking, suitable for instruction in all wisdom, knowledgeable, receptive, and capable of serving in the king's palace. He was to teach them the Chaldean language and literature. The king assigned them daily provisions from the royal food and from the wine that he drank. They were to be trained for three years, indoctrinated in pagan society and the ideology or the ideology, uh, ideologies of the day. And at the end of that time, they were to attend to the king. Among them from the Judaites were Daniel, Hananah, Mishael, and Azariah. This is their actual, this is their names given by birth by their parents. But the chief eunuch gave them new names, okay? He gave Daniel the name Bel Belshazzar. He gave Shadrach, his birth name, a new name, Hananiah. Meshach to Mishael. So Hananiah is his birth name, Shadrach's his new name. Mishael is his birth name, Meshach's his Babylonian name. And Abednego to Azariah. What I want you to see here is you gotta understand the context. At the age of about 14, the chief eunuch goes out into the community of the nation of Israel and finds the best looking, sharpest, intellectual, teachable young men. And they're probably the age of 14. Now, not to put you on, a spot, on the spot, but I know, I know this is normally the service where our students go to student ministry, but are there any 14 year old boys or girls here today in the room? Anybody? 14 years old, 15 maybe? 14 and a half. <laughs> okay, if, if there are, would you stand? I just want to, I just want to show you in context. Uh, okay, we got one guy. Somebody needs to give, okay, we got two, okay. So I want you to just look around. Look, anybody else in the balcony? Okay, we got a few, okay. This is the context. Now, don't just keep standing for a moment. And I just want to encourage you, you because, because what, what happens is at 14, 15 years old, people say, well, they're too young. They can't make an impact. Let me just remind you, everything I'm about to teach you was made by a man who was 14 and his friends who were probably 14 or 15. So you can sit down. Thank you for, for standing up. But here's what I want you to understand. 14 or 15, they go out and they get these boys. Some of the boys' names we know are Daniel, and there were more and three of his friends. One of the things you have to realize, and this is really what a lot of commentators believe, and I didn't know this, but they believe that at the time, because the chief eunuch of King Nebuchadnezzar went out and found the boys, that the boys at that moment at 14 became eunuchs as well. What that means is, is that they can never, for the rest of their life, have children. And in a society where having a boy or children to work for the family, to carry the family name was a big deal, you can imagine the kind of blow early on to these boys. So first of all, they're eunuchs. In addition to that, these boys were taught about gods and goddesses of pagan religion. In addition to that, they were trained in literature of the pagan world. They were made to believe in secular ideologies contrary to the word of God. Not to mention they had to eat and drink foods that were forbidden by God and his law. You gotta understand at this time, as teenagers, as high school, as freshmen, they were subjected to every lewd, sexually immoral act of the empire at a young age. Does it sound familiar to anybody? And to add insult to injury, Nebuchadnezzar decides to change their names. Let's change their names that have meaning for the nation of Israel and for God, and let's give them pagan names. And for us, it doesn't mean a lot because for us, a name is like a call sign, like you could change my name, you give me a nickname, but not in that culture. 
In that culture, your name was everything. Your name defined you. Your name identified you. In fact, if you know all through scripture, Jesus is giving people new names, right? Levi to Matthew, Cephas to Peter, right? Abraham goes from uh, Abram to Abraham. I mean, God always does this. Watch what their names change to. It's fascinating. Daniel's birth name means God is my judge. They change his name to Belshazzar, which means Baal, the false prophet, protects the king. That's his identity from now on. Hananiah, the birth name, means God is gracious. What a name. They change his name to Shadrach under the command of A.Q., the moon god. It goes on. Michelle, there is no one like God, is changed to Meshach. There is no one like Aku, the moon god. You're talking about a slap in the face, right? And Azariah, God has helped me, is changed to Abednego, the servant of Nebo, the Babylonian god of wisdom. Now, I want you to think up to this point what these teenagers, these freshmen in high school have been through. I want to bring you into their world. They have watched firsthand as young 12, 13-year-old boys, 14-year-old boys, their entire homeland ransacked. They have seen this immovable temple of God decimated before their eyes. They have seen the vessels that were holy and set apart, the Ark of the Covenant, moved out of the temple, the sacred place, into a temple of a false god. They have watched their family be killed, their, their aunts and mothers be raped, their children become kidnapped, their family members exiled to a new place, in addition to the endless amount of indoctrination of a secular system and lewd acts of sexual immorality, all at the age of a high school freshman. You gotta understand, the reason I'm telling you this, everything against them is stacked for them to fail. Everything. So a student says, man, you don't understand, high school's tough. I get it, but nothing compared to this, I promise you. And yet the question is, here's the question, how do these teenage boys resist the onslaught of paganism that has been force fed to them? That's the question. Now, there's a lot of reasons. I'm gonna give you one, I believe. And the answer is, I believe it goes back to the investment of the parents in Israel. I think you would agree. The parents discipled these boys in Israel before they were deported to a foreign land. Now, let me just speak to the parents for a moment. Whether you homeschool your children, whether you put them in a Christian school or a private school or a public school, regardless of where your children are, you as a parent must disciple them in the home. Amen? Yes, we love the fact that you bring your kids on Wednesday night and drop them off to the ministry, but that doesn't mean you can hit the snooze button on parental investing in the home. And it's the job of mom and dad to teach our kids to live by a different set of standards than the world. That's our job, right? to never compromise their integrity, to stand on the word of God when the culture continues to bow to the God of Baal. That's our job as parents, right? Don't bend to what the world says or the changing ways of the culture, even though it's wrong and everybody is doing it. That's the job of us as parents. But here's the question. That's one thing. I mean, there were a lot of boys who were discipled in Israel. But the question is, what made Daniel different? What made Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego different? And it's this supernatural superpower that I'm going to share with you. You see, Daniel had a supernatural superpower that if we learn this, it has the potential to change the course of our life forever. Do you know what it is? It's the power of decision. I know what you're thinking. That's pretty underwhelming right there, right? Those are going to give me some really neat insight here about a superpower. I want to show you something Daniel does that's easy to gloss over. Watch this. Daniel chapter 1, verse 8. Watch this word. Daniel determined. Circle it. Daniel decided. Daniel set his heart that he was going to live 
a certain way that he would not defile himself with the king's food or with the wine that he drank. So he asked permission from the chief eunuch not to what? To defile himself. Now, here's what I want you to see. This was not a spontaneous in the moment determination. Write this down. Daniel determined before he had to determine what he was gonna do. Let me say it another way. Daniel made a decision on how he was gonna live beforehand so that in the moment he knew how he would decide. There is power in making a decision. I heard a story recently of a man named Mike. He was, he was about 400 pounds at the time and he struggled with just being overweight most of his life. He'd done a lot of diets, went to a lot of therapists, worked with a lot of trainers and he just never could get ahead and never could lose the weight and keep it off. And finally, he decided to go against his will to a, to a motivational kind of a po powerful, positive thinking talk about the power of changing one's mindset, which results in changing one's life. And he learned something, which is a concept I wanna teach you called decision fatigue. Have y'all heard of this before? Decision fatigue. Decision fatigue is something we all experience in life. For example, you say, I am no longer gonna eat sweets. You tell the family, no more sweets. We're not buying any sweets. We're not putting them in the home. And then the first time you go out to eat with the family, you order dessert, all right? Anybody with me, all right? I mean, that's just how it works as well. Because the problem is we are struggling on what to do in the moment. And whenever you have this tug of war in the moment because you haven't decided beforehand, you're always going to lose. In a sense, the situation always wins. Most people change, watch this. This is all science and research. Most people change when they come to what's called a point of no return experience. Okay, write that down. A point of no return experience. It's basically a point in your life when you exert energy or hold yourself accountable or pay money or get to a place where you're sick and tired of being sick and tired. And so Mike decided he was going to go to a, to a suit store and see a tailor. Mike walks in, still 400 pounds early on, but Mike's a different man than his mind. And so he goes in there and he tells the salesman, I want to purchase two suits. The suits he purchased were $700 for the two suits, and both suits were two sizes too small for him. And the salesman says, ha, who are these two suits for? And Mike says, they're for me. And the guy laughs. He's like, what are you, you can't fit in these suits. He said, no, they're for my future self. He bought the suits and brought them home. Notice what he didn't say. He didn't say, this is for me today, or this is who, for me who I wanna be. No, he said, this is for my future self. This is who I'm going to be. And so what he did is he invested money, if you will, in his future self. One of the Harvard business uh, professors by the name of Professor Christensen said this line, which is gold. You, you need to write this down. 100% commitment is easier than 98% commitment. 100% commitment is easier than 98% commitment. It would be a whole lot easier for you to say, I am never going to eat gluten for the rest of my life. That's the, that's the results the doctor just told me, and I'm not bitter about it if you can, if you can see. But then saying, I'm not gonna eat gluten for 30 days. If you say I'm not gonna eat gluten for 30 days, you are 99% more likely to go back. But if you say I am done with it for the rest of my life, it's like this, I am no longer a smoker. I am no longer an addict. I am no longer an adulterer, a liar, or an alcoholic. And you basically draw a line in the sand. See, here's what the Latin word decision means. Write this down. The Latin word decision means to cut off all options. That's what it means. It's this idea of the troops coming to battle, and as soon as the troops get off the ship, you burn them in the sea. There is no going back. You have made a decision to move forward and you go ahead with it. Michael Jordan uh, said this, he said, whenever I make a decision, I never think about it again. Probably why he's the best player ever. Whenever I make a decision, I never think about it again. See, when you make a decision that you're gonna work out tomorrow morning at 5.30, the night before, you don't hit the snooze button in the morning, right? 
because you're gonna wake up. When you make a decision that you're no longer gonna smoke, you don't go to the store and buy cigarettes. When you're sick and tired of being sick and tired about being overweight or being an alcoholic or living like the world, then you make a decision and you live with the decision. Friends, watch this. When Daniel decided that he was gonna live for God, he decided beforehand so that when he was in the pressure of the situation or wherever he was or whatever they said, it didn't matter because he had already decided how he was gonna live. Come in close. The reason some of you waffle in your faith is because you haven't decided to fully follow Jesus. Young people, look at me for a moment. The reason you struggle at school, the reason you've, you feel like you cave in and acquiesce to people uh, on the sports fields or in the band or out with friends who are lost, the reason you do that is because you haven't fully committed yourself to Jesus. You hadn't decided, you hadn't cut the line in the sand, you hadn't burned the ships of the back, you're not all in. You have to say, listen, regardless of what the world says, regardless of what the internet speaks, regardless of what the culture screams loudly, I'm gonna stand on the word of God, amen? I'm gonna live for God. I'm not gonna cower down. I'm not gonna acquiesce. I'm not gonna turn my back. I'm not gonna live like the world. I'm not gonna spew curse words like the rest of the world does. I'm not gonna disrespect people like the rest of my friends do. I'm gonna live differently than the world. That's what you have to say. And mom and dad, it starts with you. See, the reason the Christian life is such a struggle for you is because maybe you haven't fully committed and made a decision to follow Jesus. So that's what I wanna do today. I wanna offer you that. Remember, 100% committed to Jesus is always, 98, is it always easier than 98% committed. And so I'm gonna ask you right now, would you just bow for a moment? And we're gonna, we're gonna just go to the Lord and I'm gonna ask you if, if you say, Pastor, I don't feel like I'm all in. I've kind of waffled back and forth. I've ridden the fence. There have been seasons I, I, I go to church. There have been seasons I get in the word. There have been seasons that I pray and I just feel like I'm, I'm not in a season like that now. I feel like I'm cold. I feel like God's distant. I don't sense the presence of God. I don't feel or see the power of God, but I want that, I want that. Friends, God can do more in a moment with a decision than you'll ever see anybody manufacture in a lifetime, I promise you. More in a moment with a decision. So I'm gonna ask you, you don't have to say anything, you don't have to tell me anything, just in your coming, you're telling God, I'm serious, I wanna make a decision and whether it's to recommit to God or commit for the first time, I'm just gonna ask you if you feel, if you feel led to come, you just, just step out of your seat and we're gonna make these steps an altar and we're just gonna recommit ourselves to the Lord. We're gonna re-energize our commitment to God. And so if you feel led to come, no one looking around, just if you feel led, you're just gonna come, we're gonna pray here, we're gonna make these steps an altar and we're just gonna commit ourselves to the Lord. If you're at home and you're watching, you can kneel right by the couch and you can say, hey, I wanna pray and seek the Lord and recommit myself to him. Some are coming already, you come as the Lord leads you. We're gonna stand and uh, as we stand, uh, still in a posture of prayer, as I begin to pray, you just need to come, you come. Father, we pray right now as we, as we stand to our feet, God, and, and worship you through song. God, if you if you're speaking to those of us in here who need to respond and maybe recommit or commit for the first time. God, I know there's some in here today. I just pray, God, that they would come and in an act of surrender, in an act of bowing, in an act of humility, you would meet with them here in a personal and an individual way and you would welcome them. God, no matter how many times we turn our back on you, you continue to welcome us. So God, be with us now, we pray. As we sing to you, may it be a pleasing offering. We love you, Lord. We ask it in Jesus' name.